Um, the 4th of August, 1914, British Britain entered the war. That war was to become the Great War or the First World War. It is often quoted uh, that the period changed the status of women in Britain forever. Was it as the suffragette Millicent Fawcett claimed, a period that revolutionized the industrial position of women? It found them serfs and set them free? Today we're going to examine how significant women's war work was in winning the vote for women over the age of 30 who of course qualified due to their ownership of property um, or their marital status. Or was the end of the war back to the kitchen when the men came home? 80,000 women served in the armed forces in the First World War as non-combatants. They worked as nurses, ambulance drivers, and munitions workers. Some seven and a half addition, a million additional women would work in the war effort by 1918. Today, I am joined by Paula Kitching. Paula is a historian writer specializing in war, genocides, and cultural history. She's written for educational publications, books, museums, and websites. As a freelancer, Paula has advised, initiated, and led projects on the Holocaust in the 20th century and uh, on the Holocaust 20th century conflicts and minority and ethnic histories. She's worked for the Department of Education and Skills, the Royal British Legion, the Historical Association, the London Jewish Cultural Center, the Association of Jewish Ex Servicemen and Women, AJEX, and Believe in Me. For over 15 years, Paula has been a history guide and continues to take groups to the Western Front, Normandy, Krakow, and Berlin. Recently, she's led the Royal Air Force Centenary Project, RAF 100 in, 100 in schools, um, an RAF funded project for the Historical Association working with the Institute of Physics. For the last three years and continuing, she's been the historical and project manager for We Were There Too, Jews in the First World War and for the last year, the historian and educationalist on Journeys Home, South Asian Servicemen, and the First World War. She continues to work with the Historical Association. We were there too, Ajax, and projects on Indian servicemen. In February 2019, her, 19, her new book, Britain's Jews and the First World War, was published. Welcome, Paula, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's our, indeed our great pleasure. You've uh, you've been a great friend to the college and um, it's always lovely to have you here. Now, Paula, let's start by, let me throw a question at you. Please do. In the immediate term, what kind of opportunities did the war open up for women? It's an interesting balance because you can't separate the war from the sort of movement that was already happening. So the suffragist movement had, you know, really started to build up in the 19th century. The campaign for civil rights as well as women's rights was already pushing harder and harder. By the time you get to the start of the 20th century, you know, there was an increasing amount of pressure. Now, we'd also know, of course, that despite that pressure and gathering of support for women and other uh, groups within society, uh, that actually those civil rights, women's rights were still being denied in Parliament. So there's, there's no getting away from that. But we can't pretend that that movement comes, you know, it, it comes out of nowhere when we hit the First World War, which is what sometimes people do, not necessarily on purpose, but we tend to often look at history as sort of episodes. And during the First World War, the roles that women had access to expands hugely but as I say that's not because that pressure hadn't been there before it's just that now there is a pressing need so if before there was a desire for women by women and other members of society sometimes as well to get them into certain posts there was also an overwhelming pressure to stop them what happens now is there is a bigger pressure again and that pressure is this this war this conflict which has made uh the pool of men able to do certain jobs gone that's dried up young men who are fit and healthy are being shipped across the world to do their service elsewhere it takes uh, other people out of the workforce because they now have to fill those holes in other ways so women now are able to step into roles that they may have wanted to step into before they are also required desperately 
desperately required to step into roles. So there is, ma is a massive expansion of opportunity for women, but the pressure to create those opportunities were already building. It's also worth you know, remembering, and I always point this out, that when people talk about women's employment during the First World War, and women now are working in factories, women have always worked in factories. You know, we have a, a history of women in industry and other areas of work. Mm -hmm. um, the term working class women gives you an idea women mm -hmm. have worked. But what we see during the, the First World War is the range of opportunities expands. The types of women that work changes. Now, that's also very significant. Uh, and the areas that women are uh, comfortable in and skilled in also expands. So there is a change. It is huge in many ways, but it's also the result of the other factors as well in build up. And I just think it's important to put that a little bit into context before you then examine what changes and, and what happened. It's an interesting point you make because you talked about the fact that particularly with working class women that that there was you know a familiarization with with the industrial life um would how prepared they were to undertake the jobs that they had to do during the first world war be largely dependent on their background yes absolutely and again we've got to put some of this into context working Working class women worked outside the home in paid employment, but working at home was also, you know, a huge task. I mean, we now talk about, you know, work in the home and, and believe in, in 2020 and 2021, many of us have felt working in the home is, has its own weights and burdens. But we're talking about working in the home at a time when, you know, there are none of the labour saving devices or very few of the labour saving devices that we have today where families are big. You know, birth control is, is not a factor. So working class families will often be large families with large amounts of cooking, large amounts of cleaning. So even if you didn't work at, outside of the home and you worked in the home, your work would be laborious and, and difficult and time consuming. And the further you went up the social scale, the more likely you were to have somebody assist in that. And that includes actually some of the, the upper elements of what we think of as working class. You know, a working class household that was doing well would employ somebody to come in at least part time to help with that, that household burden, which was huge. Mm -hmm. So it a it's different kinds of work that people were able to do. Having said that, again, in industry, lots of women now work in uh, areas of industry that they hadn't gone into before. They work in skilled requirements. And that was one of the things that was different about this expansion, mm. was that women had often been asked to do low skilled, low paid work. Now, with the need in industry during the First World mm. War that was there, women were, were being chosen, reluctantly or otherwise, to do more skilled work and that was absolutely necessary it's also worth recognizing that because it is different classes that will go into this the middle class women will also go into this they'll go into it because they're required and because the opportunity is there now the middle class women will take up a range of chances opportunities some requiring and sh showing the education they have which is absolutely crucial um they be, will become clerks in the civil service because they have a high level of education. Mm -hmm. They will go into jobs requiring language skills because they have a high level of education. It's worth remembering that the women who become ambulance drivers are middle class women because working class women in those days wouldn't have been able to drive a car because cars were the preserve of the wealthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, some of the things that people go into is a result of their class and background, as well as the need that's there. It's interesting. Let, let's break that break that down and talk about the two different uh, sh uh, spheres that open up. So we'll talk about military work, but let's stick on an, an industrial work for now. The trade union movement was massive in Britain at that particular time. Um, was the traditional trade union movement an obstacle to progress for women or was it a, a something that they welcomed this new opportunity um, and they welcomed this 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 um, change in the nature of the workforce? 
it was it was variable um you know there are trade unions who have been working and acting on behalf of women and women's pay and women's uh safety in factories for decades um but britain I mean, I always say this to all my groups whenever I start uh, and you read out my CV, so you know the kind of work. I'm, Britain in 1914 was sexist, classist, racist. And there's no point in ever pretending otherwise, because then you're doing a misfavour to history. It, it is what, what it was then. Those were the attitudes were there. And that applied very much across the board to what women were allowed to do. Now, the trade, while some trade unions were supportive of women's rights and women's access to work, Many were run by men for the reason, the protection of the men that they employed. It was a deal done in many factories that women would only be allowed into those factories to, to cover the war work, that once the war was over, they would be removed mm. and the men would in return would be given their jobs back. And that occurs in lots and lots of places mm -hmm. during 1918, 1919, 1920. Um, and we see some of the more... Uh, progressive factories often belonging to the Quaker you know to Quakers where they actually have done these similar deals but actually after the war realized that there are women whose partners have not come back mm. and therefore they rely on this work to be able to to feed their families their children or their partners have come back and are no longer capable of returning yeah. to their job mm -hmm. and so you see certain factories uh, introduce a sort of post-war sliding scale yeah where depending on your needs, you you don't. But there was very much an attitude after the First World War that that's it, women are done now, off they go. The trade unions they want the men back in the work. So the trade union movement was mixed. Mm. It wasn't quite as unified as we think about it now. It was very mixed, and it was very much dependent on the the circumstances, the factory work, the areas of employment, and who was in charge. Mm. It's really interesting. Now let's let's go to the other side. Oh. Let's talk about women who served in the armed forces. I had mentioned in the introduction that there were approximately 80,000 women who by 1918 had served in some capacity as non-combatants in the British Army. Um, can you elaborate on their roles and maybe perhaps talk about how close to the fighting they came? Well, again, it, it's very it's interesting. You know, back in 1914, uh, a number of, of the suffragists, in particular some of the suffragettes, had said that women should be allowed to serve in the armed forces. And they were pretty much laughed out of Whitehall. Mm. Um, of course, by 1917, everybody's changing their mind on this because they need more men at the front. And why on earth are you having men acting as clerks when you could have women doing those jobs? Why are men acting as cooks when you could have women as those jobs? Yeah. So there is a variety of work that women were done. But it's also worth pointing out that in 1914, there was already one section of the military that had women in it. And this had been formed far earlier. And this was an organisation called the Queen Alexandria Imperial Military Nursing Service. And that had been formed just after the start of the 20th century with the specific purpose of having professionalised nursing close to uh, the war, war zones. And the Queen's nurses were considered the elite of nursing. For example, you could only be a Queen's nurse if you already had three years worth of medical training. Well, in those days, you know, there's no NHS. So the level of medical training you get in a hospital is dependent on whether or not you can go to one of work in one of the best hospitals so again we're talking about top of working class middle class women okay mm -hmm. um so the quins exist and the quins exist in 1914 like every all the other parts of the armed forces they are massively understaffed and have to have a huge recruitment drive in 1914 uh but they don't drop their standards they're very snobbish in their attitude it said quite clearly they had to be women of, a, of good character from respectable homes you know right. as well as their three years worth of already training so these women are professional nurses with a lot of skills good backgrounds as was considered then and uh, they were already working with the military so these are professional nurses they were sent straight you know Straight to the Western Front, the women, Quinn's nurses, are on um, hospital ships off the edge of the Dardanelles throughout the campaign there. They're in uh, in Egypt to deal with the Middle East campaign. As I say, they're all along the Western Front. You know, And prior to that as well, these nurses had served all over the world at various points. Some of them had served all over the world with, with the British Army. So there is a presence of a female presence, mm. but it is in a very specific role. Mm. 
what we see in 1917 is an opening up or again of the world's so a bit like it mirrors the rest of society really and we start seeing that women are given other kinds of jobs so they will become cooks they will become um cleaners but they will also begin to be clerks and they will pick up other bits of posts now we know that because we have the photographic evidence we know that in certain places such as ref bases they'll do um basic engineering work you know we know that they will be fixing um rotor blades on aircraft they will be employed doing anything actually that they are needed to do mm-hmm. so a number of, of things open up what they cannot be and of course rather interesting again we have sometimes short memories what they cannot be and won't be for decades to come is allowed to be combatants yes but the support work they're there and one of the arguments i've always said you know we because when we focus on and look at women's stories the first world war there was certainly when i first started doing this there was an attitude of yes yes they were there and they were nurses and it's great but you know they it's not like they experienced the war in the same way Many of the nurses were frontline nurses. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're physically or orderly on the front line, they're, but they are in certainly in the casualty clearing stations very close to the front line. And we have nurses right. who get killed as a result of, you know, uh, of war damage and, and things. But also those nurses are working in pretty horrific circumstances a lot of the time. Every casualty of war, the physical casualty of war, the damage, they will see. And they will do that while still see that while still doing their job. They will do their job whilst also knowing that many of those that they are helping will not survive. They will be writing them those letters to help them when they get home. They will be reading their letters because they're the caregivers as well as medical professional. And they will see absolute firsthand the horrors of conflict. Mm. So of course they experience the horror of war and their stories shouldn't be pushed to to one side, you know, because actually the vast majority of them hold it together and do not fall apart. But in terms of the armed services, the roles, the women's sort of units almost expand to fill the roles they're required in. What, of course, is absolutely tragic is that after the First World War, those now skilled women doing important jobs, all three of the armed services that have their auxiliary female roles will close them after the First World War. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's important that even, this, even before the Second World War starts, so 1938, all those auxiliary units, sometimes with slightly different names, but they'll all be reformed. Because right. what is recognised is that actually the contribution that women played in those roles will be if will be required again if Britain is about to to embark on another war. Okay, an interesting lead there. Then you know, can can you help us understand the degree to which women were able to achieve social change? Because you know, it strikes me at least initially that that in, in the short term maybe not that much but there was the lingering notion uh, of uh, of the impact and that clearly ha- it is changing minds can, can can you help us put that in context how much social change was there again it's a, it's a mixed story mm. so uh, when i first started working this again people say well of course by the end of the war women have done all these things and uh, that had changed society well actually no it doesn't i mean women are wanted to do these jobs because we're in a condition of war Mm. from 1919 and there are plenty of people men and women who who quite like women to go back in that box back in the pre-war box please Mm. um actually the men have returned we don't need you in the factories actually the men have returned to the land we don't need you on the land anymore Mm -hmm. um we'd quite like to go back and go away now of course you can't do that or you can with some groups and the reality is that for many working class women, their choices now were suddenly curtailed again. Mm. So they married. I mean, again, we have this idea of, of a lost generation, which we do. You know, lo- large amounts of, of men never return. But actually, for working class women, marriage rates begin to go up. Mm. And they go up because in those days, if you didn't marry, you had no status. So you married the men who came back, regardless of the condition of them, mm. because if you didn't, you had no status. Right. 
So we see, especially for that group of women, not dramatic changes, actually, in many ways. It will take another generation. It will take their daughters or nieces mm. to say, hang on, if you worked in the factory then and had this freedom, why can't I have that? So it'll take another generation. With the middle class, you have a slightly different approach, which is middle classes... Because so many middle class boys have become officers mm. and officers had such a terrible success rate in survival in many ways. So, so for example, uh, on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, which is probably the most famous first day of a battle in British military history, and we have 58,000 casualties resulting in 19,000 deaths. Um, of the young officers who go out, the junior officers who go out that day, so we're talking second lieutenant through to captain, mm they have a 60% casualty rate. Now, we know six casualties aren't necessarily deaths, but that takes them out of the line, and that's a huge figure because junior officers lead from the front. Mm -hmm. Now, because of the classism of British society, junior officers are middle-class young men. They're not no longer just the aristocracy that might have been there before. They are also, you know, well done, nicely educated grammar school boys, but they are that middle class band. Mm. And they take a real hit in terms of uh, casualty and, and death rate. Now, you were then faced, therefore, as a middle class woman with two choices. Do you marry somebody out of your class or do you choose not to marry? because the numbers of those coming back have dwindled. Mm. Now, if you are financially able to support yourself, either because you've managed to get a job that actually isn't going to be throwing you out on your ear, so you're now a governess or you're a teacher or you're a clerk, the civil service expanded the number of women who worked in its offices hugely and actually didn't get rid of them all mm. because they had skills. Um, so if you have a reasonably okay job profession that pays you if you are sufficiently comfortable because your family have enough money that actually their daughters shouldn't work which was the attitude of certain classes in those days yeah yeah then you might well choose not to marry mm. somebody you don't really want just for the sake of it and because lots of women in your class are doing that that's slightly more acceptable so those women might have held on to their jobs mm. possibly Many didn't, you know, some of them didn't, but could afford to not work necessarily. But it's where we start seeing that sort of image of, you know, we, we associate the image of the kind of negativity around the spinster as a Victorian thing. But actually, this is the age of it. So now you've got the women in their 30s and 40s who aren't married. Mm. Um, we've got basically the Miss Marple generation. Right. Bright, not going anywhere, so to think. Mm. And they, of course, are hugely influential on their nieces. You know, they're the ones who are saying, you know, actually, it's great that women get the vote in, you know, in 1918, but actually we haven't really. Right. You know, and they're the ones who are pushing for the for the real you know, change in, in democracy have, that happens in, 18, 20, in 1928. You know, so it's that that kind of thing. So it's not a, it's not an easy win. It's not a one size fits all telling of what happens to women there are these different elements of it according to personal background and education and experience yeah in, indeed that's that's really quite complex you know and i often think uh how, how not only how difficult it would have been for those women who were expected by social norms to sort of go back and and, and but it, it's also i i enjoy learning about you know there's a huge amount of agency going on because they're, they're they're taking charge of of the situation May, maybe not at the fore but in, in behind um one of the other things that's always this is sort of stuck in my head and maybe this is due to personal experience so my my great grandfather um had served from 1915 through 18 survived the war um unhurt physically um but family stories and through my dad and my granddad talked about how how pops was was wasn't right after the war um i i, I you know unquestionably um this was probably the case with so many of the returning soldiers how, how did the post-war 
experience get shaped by the 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 domestic dynamic and how, how did that how did that play out for women and um you know you often hear about the double shift women going to work because their husbands can't either because they've been physically or mentally scarred but then they have to come back home and and, and do the heavy lifting in a household that that isn't right as a result of the war maybe if you wouldn't mind elaborating on this well again uh, and this is quite typical the idea that you know uh and again we've got these these ideas as stats which is the you know it, it just sort of round numbers up, up and, and down you know just under six million men serve in the british army or british union that includes commonwealth and empire i mean i'm gonna make that really clear that's commonwealth and empire as well um between 1914 and 1918 huge expansive uh, expansion in, in, in numbers um and just under one million of them, as we know, don't come back. But that means five million do. And they come back to the UK, they go back to Canada, Australia, they go back to the Indian subcontinent, that some of them never left Africa and they're in Africa, you know, they're all over the world. But with now this experience of conflict, which you talk to any veteran today or service personnel who served in conflict, they, those, those images, experiences don't leave you. So we know that this is, is there and we start seeing it um, becoming a, a norm almost within society. So if we look at some of the structures that have come out of that period. So the 1920s and the 30s is the massive expansion in veterans clubs, you know, veteran societies. Now, um, I, I don't know about you, but certainly my generation, you know, the idea of people who went to sort of the, the Legion clubs or veterans clubs, they were just men who would go around, go, 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 go to the clubs who got drunk and talked about the good old days. Oh, that's what it seemed. And actually, if you unpick that, you realise what really what they really were. And certainly in the 1920s, 30s and 50s, and you know, 40s, 50s, what they really were. And what they were, were there were places where men could go where they didn't have to say anything if they didn't want to. So if they sat in a corner with a pint rocking and somebody came in and said, oh, what's wrong with you know, John today? And all somebody had to say would, would say was Mons mm. or loose. And they'd say, oh, OK, no more needed to be said. So that, that's what the veterans clubs a lot of the time they were there for, that opportunity to go somewhere where you would be understood. And again, what we also see for women um, is a massive expansion in the WI. I mean, the WI takes its, its formed in the first, during the First World War, and we start seeing the WI as a massive expansion then. And again, it's about providing a outlet for women. So an example would be, uh, and I'll choose a personal example because it's it's a quick and easy one. My great grandmother, um, my family, were, uh, lived in the northeast of England. This is the kitchen part. I use my my family name so my professional name and um, my great-grandfather served in the first world war and is killed in april 1918 mm. tragically sadly for him but i actually it, I, looking at the records i think it was relatively quick my great my great grandmother on the other hand now had four children under the age of 10 to bring up in the northeast of england now that's no mean feat when she'd already gone out to work uh, in fact, she'd replaced her husband as, as a manager of a, of a grocer's. What she'd done, she'd gone in, she'd walked in and said, you know, now that my husband's off to war, you will be giving me his job. And nobody dared say no. You know, she was that kind of a woman. And she now had these four children to bring up. She never married because although there is a remarry, you know, there's marrying after the war, not for those who are already widowed. You've had your chance. You know, this is for the new lot. She never remarried. But what she did do was she joined the WI. Right. Right up until she died, which was in the 1970s, so she spent over 50 years of her, her life as a, as a widow, she was um, an expert in um, uh, quilt making and um, crocheting, she did weird crocheting things, and she would focus on that, that was her outlet. Mm -hmm. so all that burden that the women had, they formed their own ways of dealing with it, mm. and they would belong to these clubs or sorts now of course that's not the only way i mean some households have far more difficult scenarios 
um, where, you know, this is when children would start being registered for problems, you know, and there was a lot of problems with alcohol abuse and all those other things. It, you know, the 20s and 30s are not the golden era of the jazz clubs that we sometimes get painted. You know, this is this was a difficult history. I always think it's one of the things to, to read at that time is, is not so much the history, which focuses on, you know, as we do, quite a lot specific incidences and themes and by the 1930s we're all concentrating in case again on another war but I actually if I really want to get under the skin of the social fabrics I sometimes read the writers of that period um, and you take one of the uh, writers of that period is somebody called Dorothy L. Sayers and Dorothy L. Sayers writes crime mysteries why are they useful for a first world war historian or a second world war historian and they're useful because she doesn't she's writing at the time she's not writing to tell the story of a conflict of the time she's writing about the 1920s 30s and in many cases her stories will have people who are bruised battered hurt by war not because she wants to tell their story but they are almost incidental they are the fabric of the world she lives in so sometimes to get a grasp of what it was really like out there we need to read beyond the history books to what was then contemporary affairs and mm. um, you look at the newspapers from the 20s and 30s and they are full of quack medicines promising immediate you know these take these pills and your aches and pains from shrapnel wounds will go away yeah Ooh, give your husband these pills and he will stop having the night terrors uh there were you know there were these uh, there's this whole way of life that is becomes normalized that we've almost forgotten about mm-hmm certainly normal for that generation and whilst you know we we concentrate on the war memorials it's actually it is the five million who return that I think probably I, we would like to do more about but I know as a historian they're the ones most difficult to research because I can tell you who died because we pr- made a promise and a record to keep their memory their name but finding the five million who return and what happens that's much harder because they become the old man who lived down the street. They become the a guy who in the 1930s was obsessive about not going back to war. And the reason they were obsessive and, you know, again, sometimes we need to know this fabric of, of, of experience. You know, why were people so keen to avoid war in the 1930s? It's not necessarily because they thought Hitler was great for a lot of people. It's because they were determined to not throw another generation into war yeah. because they'd experienced it. So those the, that social fabric, men, women, interactions, how people survive is is very important, but it actually comes from lots of directions. And for lots of women, mm. in particular, sort of to return to our theme, they had felt they'd done a lot of surviving in that 14 to 18 period. Here was just the next burden of responsibility to do it. And, you know, women felt the burden of family and responsibility prior to the 1914 you know they carried the home and already for many did the double shift it's just that now they're getting paid for one of them absolutely you know that you you bring up such an important point about the need for more social history on this and and, and it's it's i mean it's absolutely fascinating and it um i wish we could talk um we could continue talking for longer but i i in the, in the interest of, uh, of time, your, your, yours in particular, I, I want to ask you one more question because there's a quote from Dorothy Peel that always sticks with me. And maybe I could ask your opinions on its accuracy. Dorothy Peel said that women got the vote, and I'm obviously implying because of the First World War, rather in the way a biscuit is given to a performing dog. Yeah, like... It carries so much weight to comment like that. Mm. And I and I look at it from a different perspective. Women weren't given the vote so much as the arguments used to prevent them from having it no longer stood up. So the arguments that so many men and on occasion women had used prior to the First World War had been women don't understand politics enough. They don't contribute in the same ways that men do they're not bright enough whatever it was that they were accused of not being you couldn't say that after 14 to 18 now the suffragists the suffragettes had both been saying that 
for, for decades. So the suffragists had been saying it for decades. But now there was this evidence pool. You can't say a woman isn't contributing when you've just seen millions of them step up and do men's work. You can't say that women haven't the intelligence to do X when they've just been delivering Y. So the arguments that were used to prevent women voting didn't stand up anymore. That's how I look at it, rather than saying, here's a little reward, please go away. Mm. Because actually, it wasn't much of a reward. I mean, start, but it's not, you know, in 1918, um, in the in the representation of the People's Act, women, certain women get to vote. But now all men get to vote. Now, that's great for the civil liberties campaigns that have been going on. But the number of men who now get to vote completely outnumbers the small fraction of women who are now enabled to vote. So it's a case of, yes, here's the vote, but it almost doesn't count because there's this huge new swathe of electorate also coming in. The women who done the real donkey work of 14 to 18 are still going to be under the legal threat threshold in the main to be entitled to vote. Yeah. So actually, it's not a thank you to those who've done their service. They're probably still not going to be able to vote. You know, the real change comes in the next, you know, representation of the people's vote in the 1920s. That's when we see real change. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's not important, the change we get with the representation of people's vote, because it is, but it's not it's not the big thank you it can sometimes appear to be. And the idea of, you know, giving a dog to a biscuit, there is an element of not so much, I don't see it as reward as keeping them quiet. Okay. You know, you can now be quiet because you've got what you wanted. And hopefully you won't notice that actually you haven't got what you wanted at all. Mm. Fascinating. Paula, thank you very much. Um, this was incredibly interesting and incredibly useful, um, particularly your, your, not only your thoughts on, on on women, but your thoughts on the importance of social history research. Um, we touched so many, so many bases that um, I'll, I'll definitely have to, um, of course, if you wish, um, have you back again, because I would, of course, like to explore your other interests, particularly Jews in the First World War, which you've recently written on. So, um, let me just conclude by saying a huge thank you um, for just, uh, uh, staying with us today. And hopefully we'll have you back to talk about um, your other interests because um, 